Okay, thank you for the introduction. And firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for having all of us here in this beautiful city of Bologna. Uh, I haven't visited the city, but it looks really stunning till now, so it's really good. Anyways, so I'll, uh, probably you are wondering where is Halle, because that's one question I often get in many of the conferences. Uh, so just to give you a brief idea where it is, so we are here. And that's Berlin and that's Dresden, so we are roughly two hours away from both of the big cities, probably those two big cities you know. And with regard to our situation within Halle, I think we are very fortunate. So that's the Weinberg campus, which is what I've been told is one of the biggest scientific campus in Germany, or at least in East Germany. And you can see here, this is our institute here, that's the small building, so we are really a junior institute in ways. Uh, we have just across the road, we have Fraunhofer, which is working on material science. Uh, further on the right, we have Max Planck Institute here, so which is very widely known for working for work in magnetic materials and stuff. Uh, we have a Leibniz Institute here for plant biology. We have the chemistry department, a very newly opened protein institute, the physics department, Helmholtz Institute. So we have a good presence of very well known institutes uh, in this campus and it's a very nice place to research and all of it is in this uh, by the by the side of Zale River so so now since you have gotten a tour of Halle or at least the Weinberg campus I can move to the talk so I'll be talking about characterizing photo, uh, photoelectric and ferroelectric properties of materials with scanning probe microscope uh, since we are talking about two different topics, we are talking about ferroelectrics and we are talking about photovoltaics, I'll be giving you a very brief overview on both the topics. Uh, for the ferroelectrics, I'll be just talking about the basic properties and how it helps in our study. We'll, I'll be talking about the photovoltaics. Uh, I think the basics everyone knows, but I'll be talking about photovoltaics in relation with ferroelectrics. Uh, I'll have a brief comparison with photovoltaics and semiconductors, which everyone is more aware of. And then I'll be talking about the bulk photovoltaic effect, which is really a combination of these two fields and how we see this bulk photovoltaic effect uh, in ferroelectric materials. Thereafter, I will be firstly talking about how we use the AFM and CFM to investigate the bulk photovoltaic effect in ferroelectrics. And then I will reverse the story a bit I will use the bulk photovoltaic effect to investigate the ferroelectric polarization in the material. So it will be something like that. Okay. So with regard to ferroelectrics, probably some of you know, some of you don't know, it's, uh, it's having a material, so I'm using barium titanate here, which is the most commonly studied ferroelectric material in which you have a perovskite unit cell, you have the barium ions here shown in green, you have the oxygen which forms the octahedra and you have the titanium which is in the middle of the octahedra. So in this case, it's a paraelectric state. There is no polarization in the material in this state. But when you go down the temperature, so below the Curie temperature, the titanium can either move up in the octahedra or down. And because of the charge imbalance which you create, you will have uh, an either a polarization which, which points upwards or it will have a polarization which goes downwards. So this is in very simple ways ferroelectric material. And the region between two polarization uh, or uh, two differently polarized regions, it's called a domain wall. So you can have regions which will have up polarization and down polarization, and the region bet between them, it will be a, a domain wall. So this is the, probably one of the most simplest of systems to understand. It gets further complicated when we talk about bismuth ferrite, which is the material of our interest in our group, in which you have a rhombohedral unit cell. Again, I am representing the entire unit cell in, in, in the form of two perovskite unit cells. But now you can see it's more complicated, and in this case, the polarization is along the 111 direction of this unit cell. And because the polarization is along the 111 direction, you can have eight different variants of domains or eight different variants of polarizations which can be seen like this. So you have a distorted cube which will be elongated along the 111 direction. So that's one domain, that's the other domain, the third domain, the fourth domain. So that's how the polarization variants in this material work. 
and therefore we need PFM to see which kind of domains we have in our material. So I'll just give you an example how these domains look like when you have a good film in your hand. So in this case, we have a bismuth ferrite film which is grown on terbium scanned substrate. There are reasons why we chose this because based on what kind of substrate you have, you can really tune the kind of domains you have inside your material. So in this case, the substrate, which is terbium scandit, it has asymmetric uh, lattice parameters. So the A is not equal to B. And because of this, when you look at the PFM, so piece of force microscope images, so this is the topography here, which looks more, mostly flat. You have an out of plane amplitude. You have an out, out of plane phase, which are mostly consistent in one color, which means the out of plane polarization component is homogeneously aligned in one direction. And then you have the in-plane amplitude and in-plane phase. And you can see these, zig the, these nice striped kind of pattern, which is formed by 71 degree domain walls. So from when you assess all of these images, you can, build up a in you can build up an image in which you have one region or one domain in which the polarization goes from here to here, and then the next domain in which the polarization goes from here to here. So therefore, since you have a right component of the polarization and the left component of the polarization, you have these nice striped kind of patterns. And since the polarization remains always aligned in one direction, so it's always down, you always see homogeneous uh, contrast or homogeneous colors in your out of plane images. So that's how you visualize these kind of materials. Then I'll be jumping to photovoltaics. So I think the normal solar cell based photovoltaics everyone is aware of. You have a P type region, you have an N type region, you put them together, you create a space charge region because of this interdiffusions, and you create a space charge barrier here which inhibits carriers which are getting generated under light from recombining with each other. So therefore you have a photovoltaic current. This is very well known. I don't know why the color is blue. If it's fine for everyone, I think I can carry on, yeah? Okay. Anyways, so that's your normal PN junction based photovoltaic cell. Then you have ferroelectric photovoltaic. So in principle, if you look in the literature, what people have talked about, it's as simple as this. You have a ferroelectric crystal, thin film or single crystal or polycrystal. You can put some electrodes on top and bottom and you put light and you will create you will have extremely high open circuit voltages. So when I say extremely high open circuit voltages, somehow it has lost the green contrast. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when, you, so when you have extremely high open circuit voltages, I'm talking about 1,000 volts. So that's what people have talked or have discussed in the literature. I mean, if you talk to people who are working, the pioneers of this field, they would tell you that they have seen sparks in their crystal. The voltage was that high. And you can see there is no junction. So like I said, you have a crystal, you put electrodes, and you have your device ready. And since it's a ferroelectric material, you can combine it with the polarization effects, with multiferroic effects, probably, and then you have a really functional device. But then, if everything is so nice, why isn't everyone investigating this thing? Because it has severe drawbacks, extremely severe drawbacks. The biggest drawback is it has extremely, extremely low photovoltaic current. You will see in the next slides, we are not talking about anything above the picoampere range. So, yeah. Then the next thing is the high band gap. It doesn't really absorb too much of your solar spectra. So for sure, you cannot use much of your sunlight for your harvesting. And the, the combined effect of these two reasons gives you extremely low efficiencies. So that's why not many people or many groups are investigating this material. So with regard to the photovoltaic effect in ferroelectrics, there are quite a few number of mechanisms which have been proposed over the years. Some have been completely uh, thrown out of the table now. They said, no, it's not existing. Some are still under debate. So let's say the first one is space charge region in which people have said that when you put light on a crystal or ferroelectric crystal, the, you create a lot of charge carriers in the region of illumination 
and these charge carriers drift away from the center of illumination to the periphery of illumination because you have a polarization component inside the material and therefore you create a space charge region. There's another theory which was about the domain walls. So the region between two domains, it acts like a PN junction. So when you create something, when you create a charge carrier in the domain wall, the electron can go on one side of the domain wall, the hole can go on the other side, and you have a PN junction. And then there is the bulk photovoltaic effect. What people have proposed in which there are also two theories which are floating. So first one is a ballistic approach in which they say, okay guys, you have a ferroelectric material, you have a polarization component, you will have, let's say, a higher generation and a higher mean free path along the polar direction, and you will have a, a lower mean free path and, and a lesser probability of generation against the direction of that polarization or perpendicular to that. So that's the ballistic approach. Then there is a shift mechanism, which I will be mostly discussing this in this talk. So that's uh, the idea behind it. And to understand the shift mechanism, we can first move to a symmetric material. So we can choose silicon or any other symmetric material that you know, in which when you, cre when you put light and when you create something or when you excite a charge carrier from the valence band to the conduction band, it will have equal probability of going anywhere in the K-space. There is no tendency for the carrier to be in a certain direction in the K-space. But when you have... And, but when you have an asymmetric material or a material without absence of inversion symmetry, like a ferroelectric material, what the studies have shown that when a carrier is, is excited from here to here, it will have a certain shift in the real space. It will really move in a certain direction in real space. So that means there has to be some kind of a drift, there has to be some kind of a field which pulls it like that. And that's, the, and that's why it's called shift mechanism, because a carrier, after going in the conduction band, undergoes a shift. And you can really calculate this shift from certain formulas. And the other requirement for this effect to exist is the presence of subband gap states, that the path of recombination and the path of generation should be different from each other. And the DFT guys said, okay, if you have something like this, you have two kinds of transitions happening. You have one transition which is happening, or the real one, which is happening from band to band. And there's another transition which is happening from the subband gap state to one of the allowed bands. And these two transitions will talk to each other. They will interfere with each other. And this interference gives you this shift of the charge carrier in the real space, which gives you a current. Again, the current is not so high, but the effect is there. And that's the beauty of this thing. That's why some groups which are investigating this effect, they want to investigate this because it's a new kind of charge separation mechanism that you have. And it has been also proposed something similar for the inorganic, organic perovskite solar cells. That, that's one reason to explain the charge separation mechanism in these hybrid perovskite cells. And when you have such an effect, it has a tensorial property. It's a tensorial photovoltaic effect. So your photovoltaic effect, which is, so your photovoltaic current here is directly proportional to the intensity of your light. And importantly, it depends on a tensor. This tensor is absolutely analogous to your piezoelectric tensor. It has, it's of the same order. It's a third rank tensor, 27 elements. And it will be exactly the same. And then you have EJ and EK, which is in this case, when you have a linearly polarized light, the the, you can resolve the electric field of a lin linearly polarized light in the, in the Y and the X direction. And this is what you have here. And then the open circuit voltage, analytically, you can simply figure out, it will be the photovoltaic current as uh, on top of your conductivity, the sum of dark and photoconductivities, and directly proportional to the, the distance between your electrodes. So in principle, if you look at this formula, the higher your gap is, the higher your VOC should be, which really works at least in our experiments, that as you keep on scaling the distance up, you get a higher VOC. So, and how does this current look like? So I showed you in the previous slide, it has a tensorial form. So how does this tensorial form look like? So if you have a bismuth ferrite sample, which is shown in the schematic, which has these nice stripe kind domains, and you send a linearly polarized light between the electrodes, 
you, and when you start changing the angle of your linearly polarized light, so you can see this angle which is your theta here, this is the electric field of your light, and you measure the current in this YC direction, you will get this nice angular dependency. It will really go f from a maxima to a minima, again to a maxima, and so on. And you can explain something. This is an extremely simplified version. You will see many more, much more complicated equations in the next slides. Anyways, so giving you this nice overview on the topic and why we are interested on this, I will move to the results now in which we are using the AFM and CFM and the PFM system to investigate this effect in bismuth ferrite thin films. So in this case, we used the stripe kind of domain patterns which I had shown you before. And we put electrodes in, uh, in a way that the electrodes are parallel to the domain walls. And we put light, linearly polarized light, and we are using the AFM in the CFM mode. So we are checking the CFM, the local IV curves, and also the PFM. So one scan after the other. And we found that indeed we have a high open circuit voltage. So you see this is the IV curve, and if you extrapolate it to the zero value, you will get an open circuit voltage of minus 35 volts. And when you start rotating the plane of your linearly polarized light and measure the current, you will get this nice angular dependent photovoltaic current. From this, we know that, okay, we have photovoltaic current or we have bulk photovoltaic effect in these samples. Thereafter, when we did the CFM and the PFM, you can see this is the in-plane piezo amplitude and this is the photovoltaic current. And if you Probably I can just move to the next one, yeah. And if you just look in the region, so this region is a domain, and if you see within the domains, you usually have very less current. At, at the domain walls, you have higher current. And this is also seen when we did a line scan across the images. And you see here, so the blue one is your in-plane amplitude, and the red one here is your photovoltaic current. And you can really see that at the domain wall, here, you will have a higher photo, uh, this is your in-plane amplitude, so your amplitude is the highest, which is within the domain, but your photovoltaic current is less. And at the domain wall, where your amplitude, the in-plane amplitude is very less, you have a higher photovoltaic current. So from this analysis, we figured out that it seems that you have a higher photovoltaic current collection at the domain wall than at the domain. But the thing is, the domain walls constitute a very small area of your entire sample, very small. So you can see they are not that thick. They are probably few unit cells in a way. And to assume that such a high photovoltaic, or high for us is whatever we measure here, but such photovoltaic current coming just from the domain walls and not from the domain seems a bit iffy. So we said, okay, let's try to investigate this further and we changed the direction of our measurement. We said, okay, let's make this electrode now in a way that the domain walls run into the electrode. So we are short, so let's say all the domain walls are going now into the electrode and we are measuring their response. And again, we did the same experiment. We put linearly polarized light we have a CFM tip. And since we have a bulk photovoltaic effect here, so like I said, at certain angles it gives you a maxima, at some angles it will give you a zero. So we have a way to switch off this effect. We can switch off this photovoltaic effect by setting the light polarization to 90 degrees. And this is shown here. So, okay, now we don't see the colors. It's all black and blue somehow. But okay, you have zero here, which gives you a photovoltaic current, and if you extrapolate it, it will give you uh, 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 an open circuit voltage. And when you bring the angle of light polarization to 90, you kill the photovoltaic effect here. And now we know from our side, we have completely suppressed the bulk photovoltaic effect. <coughs> and then we again did the CFM, PFM, the same story again. And then we realized that Again, when you do this overlap, we did a line scan across the CFM images and the PFM images, and we saw again that at the domain wall, you have a higher photovoltaic charge or photovoltaic current collection than in the domain itself. 
but in this case we know that the bulk photovoltaic effect has been switched off or it has been suppressed despite that we have a higher collection from the domain wall from this we implied that it's mostly because of the higher photoconductivity of the domain wall that you collect better from the domain wall rather than having a higher uh, charge carrier generation at the domain wall so that was the whole point for this study that we were able to figure out the role of the domain wall and the domain itself now moving to the next part in which we used this bulk photovoltaic effect to figure out the direction of polarization in the material itself so this idea that using that you can use a photovoltaic effect to figure out the direction of polarization is not new so it it was already done i mean this is one of the probably the most cited works in this regard in which they had a bfo uh, sample a bismuth ferrite thin film which was having a bottom electrode of uh, a conductive oxide and having a substrate and then they switched one region in the down direction one region in the up direction they and they measured the the the, the photo iv curves from the down polarized region and the up polarized region and they easily found that when you have the up polarization you have a negative voc when you have the down polarized you have a positive voc so they proposed this way of detecting the direction of polarization uh, uh, in a ferroelectric that you can use the voc as a non destructive way to read the polarization from your ferroelectric film and to prove this they even made a device they had uh, and crossbar architecture in which they had many they had 16 bits of bfo so up polarized down polarized and the voc that they extracted from each of these uh, memory bits was used to was used to detect the direction of polarization so and it's a non destructive way so that's why it also it has its advantages then and there was another work i think uh, it was from the group of uh, i think a group in us in which they figured out that again they were using pfm and when they had a completely uh, red or plus polarized uh, plus polarized region you have a plus current here when you have mixed polarizations you have no current here and when you have negative polarization you have negative so again this seems to be working you can use your open circuit voltage or you can use your photovoltaic current as a way to detect the direction of polarization but this is only for out of plane bismuth ferrite or any other ferroelectric it can be depending upon the symmetry they can also have in plane polarization and you cannot use something like this for in plane polarization so for this study we use the bulk photovoltaic effect to figure out the direction of in plane polarization so we used a, a measurement geometry like this we have a bfo film the substrate we made two sets of electrodes planar electrodes the linearly polarized light and we had a rather big size of the gap we had 950 by 40 micrometers i mean this is usually the size of a gap that you cannot even measure in a single scan of pfm you usually measure 50 by 50 100 by 100 max and then we use these equations so these equations we had already kind of resolved in one of our old works in which we said that if you have the p net which means the in plane net direction of polarization if it's parallel to the electrodes the the resultant photovoltaic current will be of this form so you can see again you have many tensor coefficients you have the angle theta which the light makes uh, with the direction of current and you have an offset angle of phi uh, but we can use a more condensed form of this equation and we can just say a plus b sin 2 theta plus phi and that's about it again when you have your polarization perpendicular to the electrodes you will have even more complicated equation but again i won't discuss the tensor coefficients here i will be only talking about the condensed form in which we have c plus d cos 2 theta plus chi what is of interest is this phi and chi because you can call them ideality factors if they are zero you have a nice alignment with your uh, you have a nice alignment of your electrodes with your net in plane polarization but if they have some value you will see now what happens so in the in the in the first case we use a sample like this bismuth ferrite on strontium titanate and then we started off with the initial state and you can see this is only the in plane pfm so nothing else out of plane is not shown here and you have this yellow and now in now case brown regions in which 
you can see that it's all scattered random polarization directions, yellow and black. Then we switched the gap. So we had these electrodes, we applied a high electric field and we tried to switch this gap, the polarization. And you can see now you have more yellow and less, less uh, black. And then we switched in the other direction. In that case, we applied the field in this direction. I don't think you can see the arrows now. They were supposed to be red arrows here. But uh, yeah, okay. And now you have more dark region here. And what happens to the photovoltaic current? So after each and every uh, PFM and uh, switching step, we did, we measured a photo IV curve. And from there, we extracted the short circuit current, and which is plotted here. So you can see in the initial state, this is the current that we, are, we have. After the first switching, which is the triangle, the curve moves up and also moves along the x-axis. And after the second switching, it more or less flips in the negative side. And when we extracted the values of these coefficients, you get some ideas now. So I would rather just focus on the, on the, on the value of phi. And this is the initial value of phi when, we were, when it was an unswitched gap. And we knew that from, we did many more scans to figure out the rough direction of in-plane polarization. And it was kind of tilted in this direction, which is also visible in your phi here, which is around 34.8. After the first switching, the phi moves to minus 61.7. So it moves from this direction to this direction. And after the second switching, it's more 180 degree switching, or let's say, because it moves from minus 61 to plus 63. So we can really track the switching in the ferroelectric with this angle phi. And then we said, okay, but this is a more chaotic system. You have random polarization directions, which might or might not be such too representative of this, of this analysis. So we said, okay, let's go to a system which is more ordered. So we again move back to this stripe kind of patterns which I had shown before with planar electrode geometry. And this is what we found. And you have, so we started with this situation in which the, the domain walls are going into the electrode. Then we moved to an intermediate switching state in which we had applied not the highest, not the lowest, somewhere in between the, the electric field. And you can imagine, so the polarization direction in this region is in this direction with this arrow. The polarization, the polarization direction in this dark region is actually horizontal. So you can imagine that the net polarization would be at an angle of 45 degrees, somewhere here. And then after the first switching, you really have just dark regions. You don't have much of stripe region left. And after the second switching, you have just the bright region. So we know from PFM we have switched nicely everything. And then when we look at, and here are the photo IV curves, so we start with something like this. I, if I read it, no, sorry, the square one. And then the intermediate stage, which is here, so the curve moves a bit in the negative quadrant, moves along the x-axis. Then we completely switch, so it really moves in the positive side, and when we do the, uh, another switching step, it really flips. And now when you see the phi, you see now that the initial phi was already very less, it was 5.1, which means the polarization was already quite nicely aligned parallel with respect to our electrodes. There was still, still some tilt, but that could be from our lithography process. And when we do an intermediate step of switching, what you see in the PFM that we should have a net polarization which is tilted by 45 degree, we get from the photo IV, it's around minus 48 degrees, so it's also quite matching. Then after the first switching, you can see from minus 48, it really goes perpendicular. So there should be an arrow here, but yeah, it should be facing like this. So it really goes perpendicular to the electrodes. It goes into the electrodes. And then when you do the second switching step, you get plus 90. So what we are seeing in the PFM, we are nicely seeing in our photovoltaic measurements as well. So we can use something like this for detecting in-plane polarizations over large areas. So like I said before, we are using a gap of the size 950 by 40 micrometers. It's a very big area to uh, do PFM on. And then again, we did something similar. In this case, the results were even more uh, agreeing with our uh, analysis. So 
we started with this situation and the chi here in this case was minus 2.3 which means the polarization was already going into the electrodes it was nicely perpendicular to the electrodes we move to the intermediate stage and suddenly we don't have any chi we don't have any other factor because this is the curve the photovoltaic current absolutely loses its angular dependency and in the pfm it was clearly seen that because you have more or less 50 50 uh, percent of oppositely poled regions and therefore you lose your bulk photovoltaic effect and therefore you don't have any chi anymore and thereafter when you do another switching step you pole it completely in one direction you again get only 0 0.5 which means it's perfectly perpendicular to the electrodes which is visible in the pfm and again you do another step you flip it and again you see it here so from these measurements we can clearly say that we can use something like this to figure out the in-plane polarization component in your materials which are showing photovoltaic effect uh, on, a, on a large scale. And we tried to figure this out, so we combined these two equations, so one for the parallel arrangement, one for the perpendicular one, and we just gave a ratio of 1 minus x and x, and x is the extent of switching. So, and from these, from this fitting analysis, we were able to figure out that, okay, when we start from the unswitched state, when we start switching, how much portion of your ferroelectric is getting switched as, as you keep uh, applying these fields. And you can really track it nicely using an, an, an analysis like this. And this was also supported by our PFM images. We did a, a statistical study that we did 10 scans from different regions to figure out what is the value of X. And the and they were nicely agreeing with these. Probably the, the differences were around 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 something. So, and that's the amazing part about it, that why this photovoltaic effect seems to be nicely agreeing with the, uh, with the domain scenario in the gap. The thing is what I had said before, both the bulk photovoltaic effect and the piezoelectric effect, they both have the same tensors. So in principle, we can use one to investigate the other because they have the same tensor order. And this is what we have shown in this work. So as a, concluding, as a conclusion, I would just go back to my previous slide where I said you have a bulk photovoltaic effect which can be used by the PFM to, to be investigated and with CFM. And then you have the BPV effect which you can use to figure out your ferroelectric polarization. So it's a kind of a circle that we are trying to make now. Okay, with that I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks.